I'm Pat Tully of the Ketchikan Public Library, and this is Reading Aloud. Tonight, I'm going to read a few short pieces by Don Marquis and Stephen Leacock. Don Marquis was born in Illinois in 1878, and he did newspaper work in Philadelphia, Atlanta, and Baltimore. He's best known today for his series of poems featuring literary cockroach Archie and his friend, a hedonistic cat named Mehitable. Now, those poems are still in copyright, so I can't read them here, but I highly recommend them. They're both funny and profound. I'm going to read two short essays by Marquis from his newspaper series called The Almost Perfect State. One, no matter how nearly perfect an almost perfect state may be, it's not nearly enough perfect unless the individuals who compose it can, somewhere between death and birth, have a perfectly corking time for a few years. The most wonderful governmental system in the world does not attract us as a system. We are after a system that scarcely knows it is a system. The great thing is to have the largest number of individuals as happy as may be, for a little while at least, some time before they die. Infancy is not what it is cracked up to be. The child seems happy all the time to, to the adult because the adult knows that the child is untouched by the real problems of life. If the adult were similarly untouched, he is sure that he would be happy. But children, not knowing that they are having an easy time, have a good many hard times. Growing and learning and obeying the rules of their elders or fighting against them are not easy things to do. Adolescence is certainly far from a uniformly pleasant period. Early manhood might be the most glorious time of all if it were not the sheer excess of life and vigor gets a fellow into continuous scrapes. Of middle age, the best that can be said is that a middle-aged person has likely learned how to have a little fun in spite of his troubles. It is to old age that we look for reimbursement, the most of us, and most of us look in vain. For the most of us have been wrenched and racked in one way or another until old age is the most trying time of all. In the almost perfect state, every person shall have at least 10 years before he dies of easy, carefree, happy living. Things will be so arranged economically that this will be possible for each individual. Personally, we look forward to an old age of dissipation and indolence and unreverend disrepute. In 50 years, we shall be 92 years old. We intend to work rather hard during those 50 years and accumulate enough to live on without working anymore for the next 10 years, for we have determined to die at the age of 102. During the last 10 years, we shall indulge ourselves in the many things that we've been forced by circumstances to forego. We have always been compelled, and we shall be compelled for many years to come, to be prudent, cautious, staid, sober, conservative, industrious, respectful of established institutions, a model citizen. We have not liked it, but we have been unable to escape it. Our mind, our logical faculties, our observation informs us that the conservatives had the right side of the argument in all human affairs. But the people whom we really prefer as associates, though we do not approve of their ideas, are the rebels, the radicals, the wastrels, the vicious, the poets, the Bolshevists, the idealists, the nuts, the lucifers, the agreeable good-for-nothings, the sentimentalists, the prophets, the freaks. We have never dared to know any of them, far less become intimate with them. Between the years of 92 and 102, however, we shall be the ribald, useless, drunken, outcast person we have always wished to be. We shall have a long white beard and long white hair. We shall not walk at all, but recline in a wheelchair and bellow for alcoholic be beverages. In the winter, we shall sit before the fire with our feet in a bucket of hot water, with a decanter of corn whiskey near at hand, and write ribald songs against organized society. Strapped to one arm of our chair will be a forty-five caliber revolver, 
and we shall shoot out the lights when we want to go to sleep, instead of turning them off. When we want air, we shall throw a silver candlestick through the front window and be darned to it. We shall address public meetings to which we have been invited because of our wisdom in a vein of jocund malice. We shall, but we don't wish to make anyone envious of the good time that is coming to us. We look forward to a disreputable, vigorous, unhonored, and disorderly old age. In the meantime, of course, you understand, you can't have us pinched and deported for our yearnings. We shall know that the almost perfect state is here when the kind of old age each person wants is possible to him. Of course, all of you may not want the kind that we want. Some of you may prefer prunes and morality to the bitter end. Some of you may be dissolute now and may look forward to becoming like one of those nice fellows in a Wordsworth poem. But for our part, we have always been a hypocrite, and we shall have to continue being a hypocrite for a good many years yet. And we yearn to come out in our true colors at last. The point is that no matter what you want to be during those last ten years, that you may be in an almost perfect state. Any system of government under which the individual does all the sacrificing for the sake of the general good, for the sake of the community, the state, gets off on its wrong foot. We don't want things that cost us too much. We don't want too much strain all the time. The best good that you can possibly achieve is not good enough if you have to strain yourself all the time to reach it. A thing is only worth doing and doing again and again if you can do it rather easily and get some joy out of it. Do the best you can without straining yourself too much and too continuously and leave the rest to God. If you strain yourself too much, you'll have to ask God to patch you up. And for all you know, patching you up may take time that was planned to use some other way. But overstrain yourself now and then. For this reason, the things you create easily and joyously will not continue to come easy, easily and joyously unless you yourself are getting bigger all the time. And when you overstrain yourself, you are assisting in the creation of a new self, if you get what we mean. And if you should ask us suddenly just what this has to do with the picture of the old guy in the wheelchair, we should answer, hanged if we know, but we seemed to sort of run into it, you know. Two, interplanetary communication is one of the persistent dreams of the inhabitants of this oblate spheroid on which we move, breathe, and suffer for lack of beer. There seems to be a feeling in many quarters that if we could get speech with the Martians, let us say, we might learn from them something to our advantage. There is a disposition to concede the superiority of the fellows out there, just as some American capitulate without a struggle to poets from England, rugs from Constantinople, song and sausage from Germany, religious enthusiasts from Hindustan, and cheese from Switzerland, although they have not tested the goods offered and really lack the discrimination to determine their quality. Almost the only foreign importations that were ever sneezed at in this country were Swedish matches and Spanish influenza. But are the Martians, if Martians there be, any more capable than the persons dwelling between the Woolworth Building and the Golden Horn, between the Shoe Dragon and the First Church Scientist in Boston, Boston Massachusetts? Perhaps the Martians yearn toward Earth romantically, poetically, the Romeos swearing by its light to the Juliets, the idealists and philosophers fabling that already there exists upon it an almost perfect state. And now and then, a wan prophet lifting his heart to its gleams as a cup to be filled from the heaven with the fresh waters of hope and courage. For this Earth, it is also a star. We know they are wrong about us, the lovers in the far stars, the philosophers, the poets, the prophets. Or are they wrong? They are both right and wrong, as we are probably both right and wrong about them. If we tumbled into Mars or Arcturus or Sirius this evening, we should find the people there discussing the shimmy, the jazz, the inconstancy of cooks and the iniquity of retail butchers, no doubt. 
and they would be equally disappointed by the way we flitter, frivol, flutter, and fliver. And yet, that other thing would be there too. That thing that made them look at our star as a symbol of grace and beauty. Men could not think of the almost perfect state if they did not have it in them ultimately to create the almost perfect state. We used sometimes to walk over the Brooklyn Bridge, that song and stone and steel of an engineer who was also a great artist at dusk when the tides of the shallow flood in from the lower bay to break in a surf of glory and mystery and illusion against the tall towers of Manhattan. Seen from the middle arch of the bridge at twilight, New York with its girdle of shifting waters and its drift of purple clouds and its quick pulsations of unstable light is a miracle of splendor and beauty that lights up the heart like the laughter of a god. But descend, go down into the city, mingle with the details. The dirty old shed from which the L trains and trolleys put out with their jammed and mangled thousands for flattest flatbush and the unknown born of an ulterior Brooklyn is still the same dirty old shed. On a hot, damp night, the pasty streets stink like a paper hanger's overhauls. You are trodden and overridden by greasy little profiteers and their hopping victims. You are encompassed round by the ugly and the sordid, and the objectionable is exuded upon you from a myriad candid pores. Your elation and your illusion vanished like the ingenuous snowflakes that have kissed a hot dog sandwich on its fiery brow. And you say, beauty, oh, heck, what's the use? And yet you have seen beauty, and beauty that was created by these people and people like these. You have seen the tall towers of Manhattan, wonderful under the stars. How did it come about that such growths came from such soil? that a breed lawless and sordid and prosaic has written such a mighty hieroglyphic against the sky. This glamour out of a pigsty, how come? How is it that this hideous half-brute city is also beautiful in a fit habitation for demigods? How come? It comes about because the wise and subtle deities permit nothing worthy to be lost. It was with no thought of beauty that the builders labored, no conscious thought. They were masters or slaves in the bitter wars of commerce, and they never saw as a whole what they were making. No one of them did. But each one had his dream, and the baffled dreams and the broken visions and the ruined hopes and the secret desires of each one labored with him as he labored. The things that were lost and beaten and trampled down went into the stone and steel and gave it soul. The aspiration denied and the hope abandoned and the vision defeated were the things that lived and not the apparent purpose for which each one of all the millions sweat and toiled and cheated. The hidden things, the silent things, the winged things, so weak that they are easily killed, the unacknowledged things, the rejected beauty, the strangled appreciation, the inchoate art, the submerged spirit. These groped and found each other and gathered themselves together and worked themselves into the tiles and mortar of the edifice and made a town that is worthy fellow of the sunrise and the sea winds. Humanity triumphs over its details. The individual aspiration is always defeated of its perfect fruition and expression, but it is never lost. It passes into the conglomerate being of the race. The way to encourage yourself about the human race is to look at it first from a distance. Look at the lights on the high spots. Coming closer, you will be profoundly discouraged at the number of low spots, not to say two spots. Coming still closer, you will become discouraged once more but by the reflection that the same stuff that is in the high spots is also in the two spots. The end. So now I'm moving on to Stephen Leacock. Stephen Leacock was born in England in 1869 and moved with his family to Canada when he was about six years old. He eventually became a professor of economics and political science at McGill University. 
To supplement his income, he began writing humorous stories to sell to magazines and newspapers. And Leacock became one of the most well-known and loved humorists in the early 20th century. So this evening, I will be reading The Decline of the Drama by Stephen Leacock. Coming up home the other night in my car, the Guy Street car, I heard a man who was hanging onto a strap say, that drama is just turning into a bunch of talk. This set me thinking, and I was glad that it did, because I am being paid by this paper to think once a week, and it is wearing. Some days I never think from morning till night. The decline of the drama is a thing on which I feel deeply and bitterly, for I am, or I have been, something of an actor myself. I have only been in amateur work, I admit, but still I have played some mighty interesting parts. I have acted in Shakespeare as a citizen. I have been a fairy in A Midsummer Night's Dream, and I was once one end, choice of ends, of a camel in a pantomime. I've had other parts too, such as A Voice Speaks From Within, or A Noise Is Heard Without, or A Bell Rings From Behind, and a lot of things like that. I played as a noise for seven nights, before crowded houses where people were being turned away from the door. And I have been a groan and a sigh and a tumult. And once I was a vision passes before the sleeper. So when I talk of acting and of the spirit of the drama, I speak of what I know. Naturally, too, I was brought into contact, very often into quite intimate personal contact, with some of the greatest actors of the day. I don't say it in any way of boasting, but merely because... To those of us who love the stage, all the dramatic souvenirs are interesting. I remember, for example, when Wilson Barrett played the bat and had to wear the queer suit with the scales. It was I who put the glue on him. And I recall a conversation with Sir Henry Irving one night when he said to me, fetch me a glass of water, will you? And I said, Sir Henry, it is not only a pleasure to get it, but it is to me, as a humble devotee of the art which you have ennobled, a high privilege. I will go further. Do, he said. Henry was like that, quick, sympathetic, what we call in French, vibrant. Forbes Robertson, I shall never forget. He owes me 50 cents. And as for Martin Harvey, I simply cannot call him Sir John, for we are such dear old friends. He never comes to this town without at once calling in my services to lend a hand in his production. No doubt everybody knows that a splendid pit play in which he appears, called The Breed of the Treshams. There's a torture scene in it, a most gruesome thing. Harvey, as the hero, has to be tortured, not on the stage itself, but off the stage in the little room at the side. You can hear him howling as, as he is tortured. Well, it was I who was torturing him. We were so used to working together that Harvey didn't want to let anybody do it but me. So naturally, I, I am a keen friend and student of the drama, and I hate to think of it going all to pieces. The trouble with it is that it's becoming a mere mass of conversation and reflection. Nothing happens in it. The action is all going out of it, and there is nothing left but thought. When actors begin to think, it is time for a change. They are not fitted for it. Now in my day, I mean when I was at the apogee of my reputation, I think that's the word, it may be apology, I forget, things were very different. What we wanted was action, striking, climatic, catastrophic action, in which things not only happened, but happened suddenly and all in a lump. And we always took care that the action happened in some place that was worthwhile, not simply in an ordinary room with ordinary furniture, the way it is in new drama. The scene was laid in a lighthouse, top story, or in a madhouse at midnight, or in a powerhouse, or in a doghouse, or a bathhouse. In short, in some place with a distinct local color and atmosphere. I remember in the case of the first play I ever wrote, I write plays too, the manager to whom I submitted it asked me at once the moment he glanced at it, where is the action of this laid? It is laid, I answered, in the main sewer of a great city. Good, good, he said. Keep it there. 
In the case of another play, the manager said to me, what are you doing for atmosphere? The opening act, I said, is in the steam laundry. Very good, he answered as he turned over the pages. And have you brought in a condemned cell? I told him that I had not. That's rather unfortunate, he said, because we are especially anxious to bring in a condemned cell. Three of the big theaters have got them this season, and I think we ought to have it in. Can you do it? Yes, I said. I can if it's wanted. I'll look through the cast and no doubt can find one of them at least that ought to be put to death. Yes, yes, said the manager enthusiastically. I am sure you can. But I think of all the settings that we use, the lighthouse plays were the best. There is something about a lighthouse that you don't get in a modern drawing room. What it is, I don't know, but there is a difference. I've always liked the lighthouse play and never have enjoyed acting so much, have never thrown myself into acting so deeply as in a play of that sort. There's something about a lighthouse. The way you see it in the earlier scenes with the lantern shining out over the black waters that suggests security, fidelity, faithfulness to a trust. The stage used generally to be dim in the first part of a lighthouse play. And you could see the huddled figures of the fishermen and their wives on the foreshore pointing out to sea, the back of the stage. See, one cried with his arm extended, there's lightning in yon sky. I was the lightning and my cue for it. God help all the poor souls at sea tonight. Then a woman cried, look, look, a boat upon the reef. And as she said it, I had to rush around and work the boat to make it go up and down properly. Then there was more lightning and someone screamed out, look, see, there's a woman in the boat. There wasn't really, it was me, but in the darkness, it was all the same. And of course the heroine herself could not be there yet because she had to be downstairs getting dressed to be drowned. Then they all cried out, poor soul, she's doomed. And all the fishermen ran up and down making a noise. Fishermen in those days used to get fearfully excited. And what with the excitement and the darkness and the bright beams of the lighthouse falling on the wet oilskins and the thundering of the sea upon the reef. Ah, me, those were plays. That was acting. And to think that there isn't a single streak of lightning in any play on the boards this year. And then the kind of climax that a play like this used to have. The scene shifted right at the moment of the excitement and lo, we are in the tower, the top story of the lighthouse interior scene. All is still and quiet within with the bright light of the reflectors flooding the little room and the roar of the storm heard like muffled thunder outside. The lighthouse keeper trims his lamps. How firm and quiet and rugged he looks. The snows of 60 winters are on his head, but his eye is clear and his grip strong. Hear the howl of the wind as he opens the door and steps forth upon the iron balcony, 80 feet above the water, and peers out upon the storm. God pity all the poor souls at sea, he says. They all say that. If you get used to it and get to like it, you want to hear it said, no matter how often they say it. The waves rage beneath him. I threw it at him, really, but the effect was wonderful. And then, as he comes in from the storm to the still room, the climax breaks. A man staggers into the room in oilskins, drenched, wet, breathless. They all staggered in these plays, and in the new drama they walk, and the effect is feebleness itself. He points to the sea, a boat, a boat upon the reef with a woman in it. And the lighthouse keeper knows that it is his only daughter, the only one that he has, who is being cast to death upon the reef. Then comes the dilemma. They want him for the lifeboat. No one can take it through the surf but him. You know that because the other man says so himself. But if he goes in the boat, then the great light will go out untended it cannot live in the storm and if it goes out ah if it goes out ask of the angry waves and the resounding rocks of what tonight's long toll of death must be without the light i wish you could have seen it you who only see the drawing room plays of today the scene when the lighthouse man draws himself up 
calm and resolute and says, my place is here, God's will be done. And you know that when he says it and turns quietly to his lamps again, the boat is drifting at that very moment to the rocks. How did they save her? My dear sir, if you can ask that question, you little understand the drama as it was. Save her? No, of course they didn't save her. What we wanted in the old drama was reality and force, no matter how wild and tragic it might be. They did not save her. They found her the next day in the concluding scene, all that was left of her when she was dashed upon the rocks. Her ribs were broken. Her bottom boards had been smashed in. Her gunwale was gone. In short, she was a wreck. The girl? Oh, yes, certainly they saved the girl. That kind of thing was always taken care of. You see, just as the lighthouse man said, God's will be done, his eye fell on a long coil of rope hanging there. Providential, wasn't it? But then we were not ashamed to use providence in the old drama. So he made a noose in it and threw it over the balcony and hauled the girl up on it. I used to hook her onto it every night. A rotten play? Oh, I'm sure it must have been. But somehow, those of us who were brought up on that sort of thing still sigh for it. The end. So I'm going to end with a poem by Don Marquis. This is another day. I am my own priest, and I shrive myself of all my wasted yesterdays. Though sin and sloth and foolishness and all ill weeds of error, evil, and neglect grow rank and ugly there, I dare forgive myself that error, sin, sloth, and foolishness. God knows that yesterday I played the fool. God knows that yesterday I played the knave. But shall I therefore cloud this new dawn o'er with the fog of futile sighs and vain regrets? This is another day, and flushed hope walks adown the sunward slopes with golden shoon. This is another day, and its young strength is laid upon the quivering hills until, like Egypt's Memnon, they grow quick with song. This is another day, and the bold world leaps up and grasps its light and laughs as leapt Prometheus up and wrenched the fire from Zeus. This is another day. Are its eyes blurred with maudlin grief for any wasted past? A thousand thousand failures shall not daunt. Let dust clasp dust, death, death, I am alive. And out of the dust and death of mine old selves, I dare lift a singing heart and living faith. My spirit dares drink deep of the red mirth mantling in the cup of morn. The end. Thank you so much for joining me and have a good week.